Well, hey everybody, this is Robert and welcome to today's interview. Uh, well, there are five plasmodium species that cause malaria with the vast majority of malarias being due to plasmodium falciparum. But today we're gonna to be talking about the second most common uh, reported cause of malaria, plasmodium vivax. Now my guest today says plasmodium vivax infections represent a major unrecognized burden on global health and calls it obscure and insidious. And we'll take a look at why he says that. Join me today to discuss Plasmodium Vivax, its burden, and um, the new study published in PLOS Medicine is Kevin Baird, PhD. Professor Baird is the head of the Eichmann Oxford Clinical Research Unit in Jakarta, Indonesia. He's a professor of malariology at the Nuffield Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford. Dr. Baird, welcome to the program. Thank you, Robert, happy to be here. Excellent. Um, I, I loved your paper, I loved the research that was done. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff packed into that uh, paper. But let's go ahead and start, well, start out kind of a little primer on Plasmodium vivax. Um, it's one of, one of the causes of malaria in humans can you give the audience a, a, not a superficial view, but a sub-superficial view of uh, Plasmodium vivax? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, um, there are five species that infect us. Um, and there are only two species that constitute more than 95% of the burden of infection in human beings. Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. The the others they're not trivial, but they're they're minor in terms of case numbers globally. So Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium falciparum sort of share the stage, if you will, of importance and priority in malaria research. Um, historically, uh, actually until quite recently, um, Plasmodium falciparum totally dominated the the research landscape um and there's a, there's a few reasons for that but the dominant reason for that is that scientists like me uh, were trained and believed that plasmodium vivax was a benign and inconsequential infection um, research over the past 15 years or so has shown that's that's absolutely not true that plasmodium vivax if it's not promptly diagnosed and treated, will lead to life-threatening syndromes and death uh, quite often, um, unless medical attention is, is provided. Um, so it has been the neglected major parasite among the malaria species, um, but we're beginning to learn a lot more about it than we did um, not so long ago. Where is P. vivax um, found geographically? It, it is actually the most geographically widespread plasmodium. It occurs as far north as the Korean Peninsula. Um, and, and the winters there don't bother it for a number of complex reasons. It occurs all across the um, tropics. Um, in, in the Americas, in Africa, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and, and Northeast Asia. So it's very widespread parasite. Yeah. Which populations are most at risk? It's, it's a really good question. Um, anyone who gets Plasmodium vivax and is not diagnosed and treated is, is at risk of a poor outcome. Um, but globally speaking, um, looking across that malaria endemic world, um, people who live um, in impoverished, isolated areas where good ac access to good care is, is difficult um, and usually undertaken only when one is an extremist um, and, and often too late. Um, and, and Vivax, that is how Vivax kills people. It's, it's the not getting prompt diagnosis and treatment. So the people who are most at risk are the ones who 
getting that care is relatively very difficult. Um, how does Plasmodium vivax uh, differ uh, from the more common species Plasmodium falciparum? And if, if you could do a little focus on pathology there. Yeah, they're, they're very different animals and they are animals, <laughs> they're protozoa. Um, the most fundamental difference between them is the, the way they infect the human body. Um, Plasmodium vivax is able to penetrate the vascular epithelium uh, and take up residence in spaces of the body uh, exterior to the bloodstream. Plasmodium falciparum is not very good at that. And virtually all of the, the biomass of P. falciparum will be found in the bloodstream. Whereas most of the biomass of P. vivax, we believe, will be found outside of the bloodstream. Is, is, are there some specific um, differences in diagnosis and treatment? Well, currently, the, the diagnostics are essentially the same, um, either by a microscopic examination of peripheral blood or a immunochromatographic rapid diagnostic test of peripheral blood. But it's the peripheral blood that's the, the, um, the tissue in which we look for malaria parasites. And, and therein lies the problem with P. vivax and in terms of estimating its burden. Um, the, the, if the parasites live outside of the bloodstream, but we're reliant upon the bloodstream to make the diagnosis, um, we're very probably quite often missing the diagnosis. And, and patients go undiagnosed, maybe untreated or presumptively treated. Um, in, in that respect, that's what we mean when we say obscure. So for example, the, the World Malaria Report put out by the World Health Organization, the WHO works really hard to estimate the burden of P. falciparum and P. vivax each year. And the, the, the relative numbers between those two species, it's like 15 million versus 150 million. So it's, it's an order of magnitude higher for P. falciparum. But that's, that's a, a number based on clinical attacks with a diagnosis of malaria from the bloodstream. Um, we believe this is problematic, me and my, my colleagues. We believe that relying upon that tr conventional, traditional, 100-year-old standard for the diagnosis of malaria is problematic for P. vivax. Yeah, just to give the audience a, a more clearer picture, um, when you're looking, it's, it's, it's a blood smear that we're talking about and there's a very high parasitemia with P. falciparum, while vivax uh, relapses, it hides out in the liver. And so that that's what you're essentially talking about. Well, no, that's actually something different. The, the, um, the dormant liver stages mm -hmm. uh, that P. vivax has and P. falciparum does not, um, that is a, an important hiding place for latent infection. But what we're also saying in terms of its obscurity is that you can have an active infection with P. vivax where the disease causing multiplying parasites um, are not in the peripheral blood, they're in other tissues. All right, very interesting. I, I did not know that. Um, well, you write that uh, P. vivax takes an unrealized toll on human health, global health, and you list a number of uncertainties in global malaria burden estimates. Dr. Baird, can you elaborate and uh, kind of jump into your uh, recent study? Yeah, what we're talking about in that context, and, and this is the, the insidious character of P. vivax from the title. Um, 
it, it, it's a northern clinical bias to view the harm done by malaria as limited to the acute attack of okay you got sh shaking chills and fever and you got parasites in your bloodstream that we can see with a microscope that's what we consider a classic attack of malaria and that's what the world malaria report strives to enumerate okay but in endemic areas it's not just that one episode it's years of being exposed to both repeated attacks from mosquito bites and from the liver uh, but it's also these these underlying parasites living outside of the the bloodstream and the spleen and the bone marrow and maybe the liver um that the the patient may not be having an acute attack and, and a soaring fever and chills but is actually quite functional with a low grade fever, doesn't feel well, but it can go to work and go to school. Um, but eventually we believe over years, this takes a toll. Um, there was a, a recent study in Indonesia. I wasn't involved in it. It was somebody else. Um, they followed tens of thousands of, of patients diagnosed with either P. falciparum or P. vivax and followed them for nearly 10 years. And what they saw was quite surprising that the patients who were diagnosed with P. falciparum, although their risk of hospitalization and death within two weeks of that diagnosis was higher in P. falciparum than P. vivax, that actually over years, the risk of hospitalization and death in the P. vivax cohort was actually twice as high as it was in the P. falciparum cohort. And this is that insidious harm that I'm talking about, that over years of insult and injury caused by this infection, um, it takes a toll and, and a serious toll on human health. And, and we're not very good at recognizing that. Well, um, I want to go ahead and close out on our discussion of P. vivax real quick. Uh, any, any final thoughts on, um, on the parasite itself or... Or, or the study that we didn't touch on yet? Well, just, just to say that our understanding of the biology of this parasite in our bodies is fast breaking and um, changing, you know, how, how we view this infection. Um, and and the, the emerging understanding that the traditional way that we have viewed malaria clinically and from a public health perspective uh, is based on what we see in peripheral blood and it's inadequate it, it just it, the biology of this parasite uh, exceeds the abilities of that means of diagnosis and surveillance um, inadequate for this parasite yeah um i want to go ahead and give you a chance to talk a little bit about uh, the work that the Eichmann Oxford Clinical Research Unit is doing. We, we, other than uh, Plasmodium vivax, what else are you doing out there in Jakarta? Oh, many things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've done um, quite a bit of COVID since, you know, 2020. Sure. Um, that has been a major uh, shift for us. We had to adapt and be agile and uh, flexible, and we've taken on a number of important studies with, with COVID. Um, but our malaria studies go on, um, and we also continue our work with tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. um, we do clinical trial, treatment trials of, in particular, uh, TB meningitis, and, which is a very serious infection. The treatments are quite poor. Survival rates are low. Um, so we work very hard on trying to improve those treatments. Um, let me see. <laughs> uh, yeah, we and we do um, interventions um, not only against malaria, public health interventions like trials of spatial repellents in, in rural settings, um, but also we're looking and we're beginning to look quite seriously at um, technologies that can help 
health systems surveil infections, report them, um, and hopefully improve patient outcomes. Things like um, open SRP, um, digital recording of, of health visits used by the um, health authorities in Indonesia and other countries. Oh, fascinating stuff. All right. Well, for people that are interested, the paper is called uh, The Global Burden of Plasmodium Vivax and Malaria is Obscure and Insidious. And it's published in a recent uh, issue of PLOS Medicine. And I encourage you to check it out. And I will link to it in the show notes when I publish the podcast. And I want to thank you, Dr. Kevin Baird, for your time and your expertise. I really appreciate it. Could I just add one thing? Absolutely. <laughs> that that, that pa the paper you're citing, my, my paper, is actually a collection of PVIVAX papers organized by the PLOS Medicine people. Um, and there's some excellent PVIVAX articles that are, you know, in the same issue. Okay. Um, so I'd encourage your listeners and viewers to, to visit um, the, the issue and see many other excellent papers on PVIVAX. Very good. I, you know, again, Dr. Baird, I appreciate your time. It was uh, very informative. I've learned quite a bit. You're very welcome, Robert. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, sir. Have a great day. Cheers.